Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. Growing up on my family's farm was an idyllic childhood. I'd spend long summer days playing in the cornfields and swimming in the creek that ran along the eastern edge of our property. As I got older, I took on more responsibilities on the farm, learning everything from milking cows to driving tractors. After college, I couldn't imagine living anywhere but my family homestead. When my parents retired and moved to Florida, they handed the farm over to me. At just 25 years old, I was excited and nervous to run the operation on my own. Thankfully, my neighbors were supportive. The Davis family lived in the little yellow farmhouse next door. They'd been there since before I was born. Old Jack Davis taught me how to fish when I was six and let me ride along while he did jobs around his farm. His wife Millie would send over apple pies and invite me for Sunday supper. They were like a second set of parents. Beyond the Davis property was nearly 800 acres of dense forest. A winding gravel road cut through the trees, leading back to my farm. It was the only way to access my fields and pastures from the county highway. I rarely saw anyone else out there besides the occasional deer hunter in the fall. That all changed one morning last April. I hopped in my pickup truck and headed out to repair a section of fencing along the back pasture. I was cruising down the gravel road when I slammed on the brakes. A tall metal gate blocked the road, a heavy chain and padlock secured across it. My heart started racing. Was I on the wrong road? No, this was definitely the only road leading to my farm. I threw the truck in park and jumped out, staring in disbelief at the gate. A homemade sign was fastened to it reading, Private Drive, No Trespassing. What the hell? This was my only access point. How was I supposed to get my equipment and livestock in and out? Fuming with anger, I got back in my truck and tore off towards the Davis house. Jack answered the door, his wrinkled face furrowed with concern when he saw how upset I was. I explained what I had found and asked if he knew anything about it. He sighed, shaking his head. It's that new woman who bought the acreage on the other side of the woods, Jack explained. She's trying to keep hunters and whatnot off her property. I tried telling her that gate blocks the only way to your place, but she wouldn't listen. Said you should make your own road if you need to get around. Make my own road? Was she crazy? I'd have to pave a road through miles of forest to bypass her property. That would cost a fortune. I thanked Jack for the information, and stomped back to my truck. It was time to give this woman a piece of my mind. I drove to the edge of the forest, bordering the new owner's land. A quaint little cabin had been built recently on a cleared section. Smoke curled from the chimney. I marched up to the front door and pounded loudly. A middle-aged woman with short blonde hair answered. Before I could even speak, she snapped, Can I help you? Her tone implied I was already annoying her. I explained who I was and demanded she remove the illegal gate blocking my access. The woman scoffed. That gate is to keep trespassers off my property. I have every right to install it. Not when it blocks the only road to my farm, I argued. I have livestock and equipment that need to get in and out. The woman shrugged. Not my problem. I put up signs warning hunters to stay off my land, but they still sneak in. Deer, foxes, and who knows what else. Those wild animals are destroying my gardens and landscaping. I tried appealing to her empathy, explaining that generations of my family had farmed this land. Blocking the only access could put us out of business. The woman remained stone-faced. I don't care about your little farm. This is my private property now. Build your own road or figure something else out. She then abruptly slammed the door in my face. I stood there, absolutely stunned. Who did this woman think she was? There was no reasoning with her. I'd have to involve the county authorities to settle this dispute. I immediately called the county clerk's office to inquire about the public records for our road. Sure enough, they confirmed that the gravel road predated the sale of the woman's land. It was grandfathered in as a public access easement regardless of whose property it crossed. Armed with this information, I presented my case at the next county board meeting. I explained the road situation to the supervisors and provided the supporting documents. They agreed the woman had no right to block my access. The county sent her official notice ordering her to remove the gate since it illegally blocked a public easement. A week later, I cautiously drove down the gravel road again, half expecting the gate still to be there. But it was gone. I pumped my fist in celebration. The county meant business. My victory was short-lived. The next afternoon, I returned from the fields to find my driveway chained shut. That lunatic woman had blocked my own private drive that led from the gravel road to my farmhouse and barns. Livid. I called the county official who'd helped me. He said he'd call our prosecutor to file an injunction. 
Waiting for legal action wasn't quick enough. I needed access to my livestock and to care for my livelihood. So I brought out bolt cutters and removed her chains from my private driveway. I replaced them with my own locks so only I could open them. The ball was in her court now. Three days later, the county sheriff paid me a visit. The woman had filed a complaint accusing me of trespassing on her property based on the driveway location. Thankfully, I had our certified survey map showing the property lines. Her claims were totally false. This woman was relentless. Since gates and chains didn't work, she tried sabotaging me in other ways. Over the next few weeks, I'd find her lurking around my farm near the access road. One morning, nails were scattered across the private drive, hoping I'd get a flat tire. Another day, she had uprooted the mailbox at the end of the lane, slamming it onto the ground. The final straw came when I caught her trespassing on my back pasture in broad daylight. She was snapping photos with her phone, likely trying to find any minor code violations to have me find. I angrily confronted her, demanding she leave. The woman tried insisting she wasn't on my property, but I had proof. The next day I went straight to the courthouse and filed for a restraining order against her. I provided documentation of all her harassment, vandalism, and trespassing. Finally, I was granted legal protection. She was prohibited from entering my property or blocking access to my farm. Weeks went by without any incident. Then one afternoon, I spotted her SUV parked across from my farm. She stood at the edge of her property, peering through binoculars to spy on me working in the fields. Unbelievable. I snapped photos for evidence and called the sheriff. He caught her red-handed in violation of the restraining order. Finally, she was arrested. At her trial, the judge didn't take kindly to her blatant disregard for the law. She was sentenced to six months in jail, plus probation preventing her from contacting me or coming near my farm again. Justice was served. I can once again access my precious family farm without harassment. The Davis family and I happily sat on their porch one sunny afternoon, celebrating with sweet tea and Millie's apple pie. I can finally focus on my true passion, farming this beautiful land. The next one is a pro-revenge story. I'm 31 now, but this happened when we were about 18-19. We lived on a hill here in the UK, and it was just good etiquette that everyone on our street parked outside their own houses on the lay-by outside. It wasn't something we all agreed, and every now and then we parked outside one another's houses on a temporary basis, but it was just an understanding everyone had that you don't park outside other people's homes as there's limited space. I had lived at this house for more than eight plus years at this point. My mom's still there now. And it's probably relevant to highlight the fact that we were the only Asian, Indian family on this street at this time. Everywhere else you had white people who for the most part were pleasant, and we got along with okay without issue, except one house almost directly across the road and the one left to our house. We just didn't click, really. This kid who was my age lived across the road from us. His name was Jack, not his real name. Jack's dad had left when he was young, and he had an older sister and he lived with his mom. I had a strange relationship with him. We weren't friends, and he wasn't really the type of person I wanted to hang out with, as he was kind of like a feral kid. He rarely went school, lived an impulsive life, just hanging about on the streets and messing around all the time. And coming from a strict Indian family, it just didn't fit in with my attitude. Plus, one time I got into a bit of an altercation with him, why I can't remember, but it got physical and already there was bad blood between us. It was probably, I imagine, because he said something or made fun of me or my brother and we reacted. We're not the type to instigate crap. It's not in us, but we will finish it. Anyways, he was always doing daft things. And one time when I was about 15, four years prior to the incident I am building up to, he was playing with my neighbor who lived to the left of us. Also another white kid. Probably not relevant, but maybe it is, who knows. Anyways, as they are running around, he jumps on my mum's car and stands on it and the roof, too. I see him through the windows as I'm going upstairs, and I knock on the window and shout, Get the duck off my car! He panics and runs inside my neighbor's house, and I run out pissed off at him for that with my older brother. He could have dented the car, and it was just pure disrespectful to do that. This is the kind of kid he was. Anyways, him and his mates come out the house, and we have a bit of a verbal altercation. One of them swears the common racist term every white person shouts at a brown person here, You ducking paki! I'm not Pakistani. Hell, Indians hate Pakistani people. Our people have bad history. And I get pissed off, but eventually we calm down as Jack apologizes for his mate and we go in. This kind of set a bad precedent for our relationship even further from this point on, really. Fast forward to when we're 18 19ths now. 
His mom is dating a police officer who ends up parking outside our house, and this isn't really an issue at this point, as sometimes needs must, etc. The problem is this became a recurring theme, and as we live on a hill, things get a bit more difficult. You see, everyone parks outside their own homes as there is limited space, and if our space is taken up by this police officer's car, then we can't park anywhere on the hill. We have to park at the bottom, and if we've done the shopping... Carrying this up all the way home or walking all the way to our house from parking our car can get tedious really fast, especially when it's daily. It got to a point he was doing it so often my brother thought he would ask him nicely to move, no malice or bad intent intended. He goes over to ask him if he wouldn't mind moving his car as he had space outside his own house now. The police officer takes out his police badge and shows my brother and says is a police officer and will park wherever he wants. My brother, bearing in mind he's only about 1920 at this point, is like, er, whatever, fine, just trying not to cause an issue. Now purely because my brother asked him if he wouldn't mind moving his car, nicely too, not being a dick or nothing about it, he made it a point to always park outside our house to aggravate us further, as they knew it was an issue for us. Every opportunity, even when he had space outside his own house. Every time. This went on for about five months, and my brother asked him nicely again two more times as we were having to put up with this daily as he was visiting his girlfriend, Jack's mum. This had gone on for months, and it gets old really fast, especially as you're looking outside your window and wondering why he's parking in front of your house, forcing you to park elsewhere and walk every day to your house, when he has space to park outside his own. They had a driveway for Jack's mum's car, but they would move this car outside of the driveway and block off the lay-by space with Jack's mum's car, leaving their driveway clear despite being able to park there. So this cop can then park on our spot. Now when you're watching the level of thought they go through to do this, you really do begin to wonder, geez, why the duck are they going to this much trouble to piss us off? Now maybe there's no racist intent, or maybe there is. I can only call it how I see it. The only Indian family on the street, we have some patchy history with his girlfriend's son and he's acting like this. Who knows, but it felt like there was something beneath it. One day my brother snapped after having put up with this for so long. He went over to him and asked him nicely again one more time if he wouldn't mind moving his car. He refused to move it. My brother responds saying, fine, you want to leave it there, the car. It's going to stay there indefinitely now. The cop watches as my my brother gets in his car and moves it within like 0.1 mm away from his car's front. He then gets into my mum's car and moves this car 0.1 mm away from its back, effectively trapping it inside. He can't move it without effectively hitting our cars now. He says he's calling the police and my brother says, call the ducking police then. Now the police response times here are poor. We had a car crash outside our house and no one came for like 45 minutes to look into it. We fully expect this guy to ring his friends on the police force to scare us, and this is exactly what he does. Less than five minutes later, talk about fast, we have a knock on the door and two police officers ask us if they can come inside to speak to us. We were fully prepared for this. We say no you can't. You and can stand right here outside and first things first. We want their badge numbers and the incident number for this call out. Every call out must have an incident number if it's an official call out. They start to crap themselves a little and become a little meek as we start to question them. Do you know this police officer? What's the incident number? What police precinct are you based at? Do you work at the same precinct at him? How did you get here so quickly in less than five minutes? They are aware that this is being recorded, by the way. This catches them off guard and they start to get a little flustered. We lay it to them saying we know this isn't an official call out, while taking their pictures standing at our door too and say we're more than happy to take a trip to the police station to address this whole fiasco with their supervising officer so they can explain it all. But our cars are not moving anywhere, and his will remain trapped there. The penny drops for them, and at this point I imagine they realize they have bitten off more than they can chew. It's not going to be a quick little favor for their buddy, as they realize we were fully prepared to go to the police station to address this. Their response, let us go over to him and try talk to him about this, they say offering to mediate the situation. At this point, this dickhead cop is watching us talk to them, obviously unaware of what's being said, and the police, his friends, cross over to him. As they do this, we go over to their police car and take pictures of this as well as them talking to their friend as they watch us. There's no way they can deny not being here. The gravity of the situation starts to dawn on them, no doubt. Let me explain. 
They are on an unofficial call-out during their working hours doing something highly questionable which appears to be potentially racially motivated. The fact that we are the only Asian family on the street and being subjected to this antagonization isn't helping the issue. Nor is the fact that he has chosen to park outside our house when the entire street is empty, which we duly photographed. Technically, he hasn't broken any law, but it's this kind of crap that can seriously leave a nasty mark on careers, especially if we pushed for a formal investigation or went to the press about this victimization. It was a crap storm brewing that no cop wants to be a part of, and the fact that they are out on an unofficial call-out doesn't help as there's no call log or reason for them to be there. They have no excuse for being there unless it's completely off the books. Less than three minutes later, the two police officers and this dickhead cop come around and apologize with him, saying, I'm sorry for parking on your street. It will never happen again. He never did either. Eventually, he broke up with Jack's mom a month or so later too oddly. Jack, however, wasn't too bad in his older years. They moved away after a couple years, and I didn't hear much of him until my neighbor on the right side of my house mentioned that his older sister killed herself. I felt really kind of bad for him knowing this, especially given our patchy history with his family. His sister had a daughter, too. She left behind regardless of our history. I would never have wished that type of karma on them. The next one is a petty revenge story. So my friend, I'll call her Melissa, 22F, let an old high school pal, I'll call her Karen, 25F, move into her house about a year back. She brought along with her her big dog and two-year-old son. Melissa knew this would be a big change, but Karen assured her they were both well-behaved, and she needed a place to stay to get away from her baby daddy, who we later found out was actually a really sweet guy. Problems started almost immediately. The dog ruined Melissa's couch, and Karen did not respect my friend's house. She left trash and food everywhere. Karen constantly invited her baby dad to stay the night despite Melissa saying he was not allowed in her house. The dog and Karen tormented Melissa's one-year-old cat to the point where the poor thing never came out anymore. Then, to top it off, when Melissa told Karen she had to leave after about five, six months, Karen resorted to verbally abusing Melissa. She spread horrible lies to people, and it's a small town, made fun of medical conditions Melissa has and said incredibly inappropriate and insensitive things about her mother who struggles with alcoholism. There's more, but let's get to the revenge part. Melissa went no contact after she kicked Karen out. Fast forward about a month, and she receives a call from Karen while she's at the JFS, Job and Family Services office. She was asking if she could use Melissa's address for her insurance to save a buck. My friend said absolutely not, and that she doesn't appreciate being asked to commit insurance fraud, then hung up. She stewed for a moment, then called back, but she didn't call Karen. She called JFS to report her. Karen apparently used her address anyway, and was trying to get out of a bunch of medical bills she had stacked up. She was hit with a 28k fine. How did my friend find this out? From Karen's baby daddy? They bonded over this, and had started seeing each other. The next one is a malicious compliance story. So I used to be a union delegate for a large firm with multiple sites. We had a Karen of a manager who was appointed by her uncle, a director of the firm, to her role. She wasn't very bright and told me once that 40 was half of 100. I have written on this subreddit before about her. Where I work, we get four weeks of annual leave, two weeks of sick leave, and two days of bereavement leave a year. All this leave is accumulating too, so if you don't use it, it builds up. So one of my union members, Max, goes to Karen and asks for bereavement leave, and she refuses, as Max has no proof his grandmother has died. She also quotes part of our employment contract that states managers can ask for proof of death for bereavement leave. Max explains he is from a culture where funerals are very important, but Karen still refuses him. He tries to explain that it's not just the grieving process, but also the actual cultural event for social reasons. Max is flabbergasted and comes to me, Our contract actually states proof is required if the employee has a poor leave record. It also states that without a poor leave record, bereavement leave cannot be refused. Max has worked for the firm for five years, without a single day off besides annual leave. I approach Karen about it, and she says she won't talk to me about it, and that I'm wrong. She tells me to take it above her if I have a problem, but she is right. By sheer coincidence, it's a quarterly union meeting with the executives later that day and as per Karen's instructions, I take it above her. Max is also from an ethnic and cultural minority. Come the meeting, I explain the situation to everyone present, including Max's ethnic and cultural background. I ask four questions. 1. Why are you breaking the employee contract, and are you prepared to go to court? Because we are. 2. 
Why is the firm being culturally insensitive? 3. Why is the firm being racist by denying someone's ethnic and cultural beliefs? 4. Where is the general compassion from the firm? There was stone-cold silence for a good two minutes. The head of HR offered his apologies. He told me the leave would be granted. He would personally ring Max and grant him leave and an apology. Karen got blasted by multiple senior managers. Karen would have been sacked, but her uncle, the director of the firm, stopped this. Every manager on my worksite the following week spent three days training in employee rights, racial and cultural sensitivity, and compassion in the workplace. They also got told the training was because of Karen's actions, which alienated her from the management group. Max got a full week off with pay without needing to use his bereavement leave. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.